I'm James Heider. I'm a patient advocate with Lung Cancer Foundation of America. I'm also a patient uh, of lung cancer. Um, so I am very interested in learning more about your research. So can we start out just quick with for introductions? Sure. Thanks, James. Uh, Rio Sarugiego, I'm a thoracic medical oncologist, and I was invited by Rachel to join this project. Okay. And Rachel? I'm Rachel Salomonson. I work in the Real World Evidence team at AstraZeneca, okay. and it's been a pleasure working with Dr. Sarugiego on this project. Great. And I'm Martin Sandlin. I work also at AstraZeneca with resectable disease, uh, very much with targeted therapies. When lung cancer can be cured by surgery, not always do we succeed, right, in curing it even right. after surgery. So the whole idea of adjuvant therapy yeah, is important. And what we're learning as we're looking at the different subsets of lung cancer is that, well, you can actually select patients who would super benefit from specific types of adjuvant therapy. So for example, we know that patients who have EGFR mutation positive lung cancer, when they have surgery, would benefit from adjuvant therapy, in addition to chemotherapy with osimertinib. We know that patients who have um, lung cancer that does not have the EGFR mutation, does not have the ALK mutation, benefit from immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. But we also know that those who have those two mutations do not benefit from immunotherapy. So what Rachel was interested in doing was to see, first of all, how often are we testing people for these biomarkers, mm -hmm. right? And then when we do test and they are positive for something, how often do we match the treatment up, the correct treatment? So what she refers to as guideline concordant adjuvant therapy. So we've known, of course, that from the point of discovery, when we know something works and benefits, right from that point on, you begin to see differences in people because there's differences in access to good quality care, right? So what Rachel did was she looked at a, a uh, unique data set, the flat iron data place. Of, of, of a diverse group of institutions, not necessarily traditionally uh, academic institutions. So the real world, right. Right, real world populations. And ask the question, of these people who have surgery, who meet the criteria for adjuvant therapy, what percentage of them actually got a biomarker test? And we were, Martin, Rachel, I, I'm jumping in here talking about your study as if it's mine. You, you feel free to, please. You know, um, we, we found a, 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 a surprisingly high proportion of these patients actually got tested. That was a good okay, news. Good. Almost 80%, which is higher than most of the places we've ever looked at. This. So we're encouraged that it looks like practice at that level is evolving. Right? We're making, making some progress. We're making progress, so that's good news. And then we asked the question, is this uniformly so for everybody? And the answer is yes, but okay, there are still some subsets of patients who didn't seem to get biomarker tested quite as often as others. So, for example, people with stage 1B had significantly lower levels of testing than other uh, state patients. We found some difference between black and whites, okay, the usual um, concern. And then we found some differences in people on the basis of who's the smoking history. And uh, oh, yes. I, I think there was yeah. a little bit of a difference between certain However, racial and ethnic, uh, other racial and ethnic groups. When we now ask the next question, of those people who are positive for a biomarker, um, and then you went on to, to say, did you give the right adjuvant therapy? What you find is, although there are differences in survival between people, when you look at the subsets that received the correct guideline recommended adjuvant therapy, suddenly there's no survival difference. Uh -huh. So the lesson here is good care leads to uniformly good outcomes. And the challenge we have is to ensure uniformly good care for everyone if we want uniformly good outcomes. Um, I just want to emphasize two things. Number one is 
one good reassuring piece of evidence from this paper is that biomarker testing rates with all the jawboning efforts and nagging and everything we've yeah. done the nice thing is it seems that's coming along it's not it's not there yet it's 80 percent we're excited about 80 percent why why can't we get a hundred percent right okay so we're getting there and then we're also reassured that if we can solve the problem of equally good care for everybody outcomes will be uniformly good so that bit of work that we have to do we encourage that we're on the right track let's do it your presentation on monday where you're looking at the identification early identification of patients that can get tested so i mean you need to find the patients early in order to test them and if you find them if we test them, then they will have similar outcomes. The problem is that we don't find patients by our normal screening programs in a completely fair fashion, really. So there is really a need to work with that part. Yeah, I think what Martin is alluding to here is uh, the oral session on Monday. Uh, we, we have a paper from arguably the toughest population in the United States, the population that resides in the Mississippi Delta, right? Okay. Um, where we clearly demonstrate that lung cancer screening works. If you can do it, it absolutely works. It actually works better than what the clinical trials suggest. So in real world populations, the impact is much greater, at least twice as good as what we thought. Okay, that's number one. And then number two, is that there is an alternative way to find lung cancer early that is not necessarily screening. It's a more pragmatic way, basically applying guidelines to manage patients with incidentally detected lung nodules, right? Mm -hmm. It gives you actually three times the number of early stage lung cancer patients. Now from that point on, what Martin is saying is that when we can shift stage down to the early and then more people are able to get surgery, this is the next thing we have to talk about. Very right? important. You got to do the biomarker testing, you got to select the right people for the right adjuvant therapy. And if we can do all of that, we're going to have a quantum leap in long term survival. Awesome. Yeah. Highlight here that since you're a patient advocate, yeah. it should be noted that patients who receive guideline comporting care do better than patients who do not receive guideline comporting care. And that's the gist of it yeah. in the real world. I mean, look at that. Yeah. Big difference. Guideline comporting, not guideline comporting. Mm -hmm. These are groups of patients with curable lung cancer. The odds of being able to cure the cancer much better when the guidelines are followed, right. which includes doing the right biomarker testing and then matching up with the correct adjuvant therapy. Two step. Awesome. Well, this has been really helpful, and uh, I, I have great work and very applicable. And I think the, that takeaway of it, if we can get the care the outcomes can be equal. If we can just figure out how to reach those different groups, then we don't have to so much worry about that the medicine won't work the same or that the treatments aren't gonna work the, as well. It, it will work the so it This is work. showing that. We have assurance there. And this, these, are, these are not cherry pick populations. This is nature red in tooth and claw, you know? Yeah, yeah. very good. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much.